This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Part 3 Many and varied are the theories with which some have sought to explain and justify the existence of government. Yet all are based on the prejudiced view, whether admitted or not, that men have conflicting interests and that an external, higher authority is needed to oblige one section of the people to respect the interests of the other, prescribing and imposing that rule by, of conduct by which opposing interests can best be resolved and by which each individual will reach, achieve the maximum satisfaction with the least possible sacrifice. The authoritarian theatricians ask if the interests, tendencies, and aspirations of an individual are at odds with those of others or even those of society as a whole, who will have the right and power to oblige each to respect the other's interests? Who will be able to prevent an individual from violating their general will? They say that the freedom of each is limited by the freedom of others, but who will establish these limits and who will see to it that they are respected? The natural antagonisms of interests and temperament create the need for government and justify authority, which is a moderating influence in the social struggle and defines the limits of individual rights and duties. This is the theory, but if theories are to be valid, they must be based on facts and explain them, and one knows only too well that in social economy too often are theories invented to justify the facts, that is, to defend privilege and to make it palatable to those who are its victims. Let us instead look at the facts. Throughout history, just as in our time, government is either the brutal, violent, arbitrary rule of the few over the many, or it is an organized instrument to ensure that dominion and privilege will be in the hands of those who by force, by cunning, or by inheritance have cornered all the means of life, first and foremost the land, which they make use of to keep the people in bondage and to make them work for their benefit. There are two ways of oppressing men, either directly by brute force, by physical violence, or indirectly, by denying them the means of life and thus reducing them to a state of surrender. The former is at the root of power, that is, of political privilege. The latter was the origin of property, and that is, of economic privilege. Men can also be suppressed by working on their intelligence and on their feelings, which constitutes religious or quote-unquote a universitarian power, but just as the spirit does not exist except as the resultant of material forces, so a lie and the organism set up to propagate it have no reason except insofar as that they are the result of political and economic privileges and a means to defend and to consolidate them. In sparsely populated primitive societies with uncomplicated social relations, in any situations which prevented the establishment of habits, customs of solidarity, or which destroyed existing ones and established the dominion of man by man, the two powers, political and economic, were to be found in the same hands, which could, be, which could even be those of a single man. Those who by force have defeated and intimidated others, dispose of the persons and the belongings of the defeated, and oblige them to serve and to work for them and obey their will in all respects. They are at the same time the landowners, landowners, kings, judges, and executioners. But with the growth of society, with increasing needs, with more complex social relations, the continued existence of such a despotism became untenable. The rulers, for security reasons, for convenience, and because of it being impossible to act otherwise, find themselves obliged on the one hand to have support of a privileged class that is of a number of individuals with a common interest in ruling and on the other to leave it to each individual to fend for himself as best he can reserving reserving for themselves a supreme rule which is the right to exploit everybody as much as possible and is this way to satisfy the vanity of those who want to give the orders. Thus, in the shadow of power for its protection and support, often unbeknown to it, 
and for reason beyond its control, private wealth, that is the owning class, is developed. And the latter gradually concentrating in their hands the means of production, the real sources of life, agriculture, industry, barter, etc., end up by establishing their own power, which, by reason of the superiority of its own means and the wide variety of interests that it embraces, always ends by more or less opening, openly subjugating or subjecting the political power, which is the government and making it into its own uh, gendarme, which is like armed force. This phenomenon has occurred many times in history. Whenever a result of invasion or any military enterprise, a physical uh, brutal force has gained the upper hand in society, the consequences have shown a tendency to concentrate government and property in their own hands. But always, the governments need to win the support of a powerful class and the demands of production, the impossibility of controlling and directing everything, have resulted in the reestablishment of private property, the division of two powers, and with it, the dependence, in fact, of those who control force governments on those who control the very sources of force, the property owners. The governor inevitably ends by becoming the owner's gendarme. But never has this phenomenon been more accentuated than in modern times. The development of production, the vast expansion of commerce, the immeasurable power assumed by money, and all the economic questions stemming from the discovery of America, from the invention of machines, etc., have guaranteed this supremacy to the capitalist class which, no longer content with enjoying the support of the government, demanded that government should arise from its own ranks. A government which owed its origin to the right of conquest, uh, divine right is the kings, and their priests called it, though subjected by existing circumstances to the capitalist class, went on to maintaining a proud and contemptuous attitude towards its now wealthy former slaves and had pretentious pretensions to independence of domination that government was indeed the defender the property owners uh gendarme but the kind of gendarmes who think they are somebody and behave in an arrogant manner towards the people they have to escort and defend when they don't rob or kill them at the next street corner and the capitalist class got rid of it or is in the process of doing so doing by means of fair or foul and replacing it by a government of its own choosing consisting of members of its own class at all times under its control specifically organized to defend that class against any possible demands by the disinherited the modern day parliamentary system begins here today Government consisting of property owners and people dependent on them is entirely at the disposal of the owners, so much so that the richest among them disdain to take part in it. Rothschild does not need to be either a deputy or a minister. It suffices that deputies and ministers take their orders from him. In many countries, workers nominally have more or less important say in the election of the government. It is a concession made by the bourgeois. Both avail itself of popular support in its struggle against the monarchical and the aristocratic power, as well as to dissuade the people from thinking of emancipation by giving them the illusion of sovereignty. But whether the bourgeoisie foresaw it or not, when they first gave the people the vote, the fact is that the right proved to be entirely derisory and served only to consolidate the power of the bourgeoisie while giving the most active section of the working class false hopes of achieving power. Even with universal suffrage, and we could well say even more with universal suffrage, the government remained the bourgeoisie's servant, servant and gendarme. For were it to be otherwise with the government hinting that it might take up a hostile attitude or that democracy can never be anything but a pretense to deceive the people, the bourgeoisie, feeling its interests were threatened, would be quick to react and would make use of all of the influence and force at its disposal by reason of its wealth to recall the government to its proper place as the bourgeoisie's armed force. 
The basic function of government everywhere in all times, whatever title it adopts and whatever its origins and organization may be, is always that of oppressing and exploiting the masses, of defending the oppressors and the exploiters, and its principal characteristic and in, uh, and indispensable instruments are the police agent, the tax collector, the soldier, and the, the goiler? which I think is the jailer, to whom must be inv invariably added to the traitor in lies, be he priest or schoolmaster, remunerated or protected by the government to enslave minds and to make them docilely accept the yoke. It is true that these basing functions to these essential organs of government, other, other functions or other organs have been added in the course of history. Let us even also admit that never or hardly ever has a government existed in any country with a degree of civilization which did not combine with its oppressive and plundering activities others which were useful or indispensable to social life. But this does not detract from the fact that government is by its nature oppressive and plundering and that it, that in its origin and by its attitude inevitably inclined to defend and strengthen the dominant class indeed it confirms and aggravates the position in fact government takes the trouble to protect more or less the lives of citizens against direct and violent action it recognizes and legalizes a number of basic rights and duties as well as usages and customs without which social life would not be possible it organizes and manages a number of public services such as posts roads cleanings uh, and refuse disposal, land improvement and conservation, etc. It promotes orphanages and hospitals, and it often condescends to pose as the protector and benefactor of the poor and the weak. But it is enough to understand how and why it carries out these functions to find practical evidence that whatever governments do is always motivated by the desire to dominate, and it is always geared to defending, extending, and perpetuating its privileges and those of the class of which it is both representative and defender. A government cannot maintain itself for long without hiding its true nature behind a pretense of general usefulness. It cannot impose respect for the lives of privileged people if it does not appear to demand respect for all human life. It cannot impose acceptance of the privileges of the few if it does not pretend to be the guardian of the rights of all. The law, says Kropotkin, by which is meant uh, those who have made the law, that is, the government, quote, has used man's social feelings to get past not only the moral precepts which were acceptable to man, but also orders which were useful only to the minority of exploiters against whom he would have rebelled, end quote. A government cannot want society to break up for it would mean that it and the dominant class would be deprived of the sources of exploitation nor can it leave society to maintain itself without official intervention for then the people would soon realize that government serves only to defend the property owners who keep them in conditions of starvation and they would hasten to rid themselves of both the government and the property owners today governments faced with the um, pressing and threatening demands of the workers show a tendency to arbitrate in the dealings between masters and workers. In this way, they seek to sidetrack the workers' movement and, with a few deceptive reforms, to prevent the poor from talking for themselves what is their due, and that is a part of well-being equal to that enjoyed by others. Furthermore, one must bear in mind that on the one hand, the bourgeoisie, the property owners, are always at war among themselves and gobbling each other up, and that the other hand, the government, though springing from the bourgeoisie and its servant and protector, tends, as with every servant and every protector, to achieve its own emancipation and to dominate whoever it protects. 
Thus, the game of the swings, the maneuvers, the concessions, and withdrawals, the attempts to find allies among the people against the conservatives and among the conservatives against the people, which is the science of the governors and which blinds the ingenious and the phlegmatic who always wait for salvation to come down to them from above. Despite all this, the nature of government does not change. It assumes the role of controller and guarantor of the rights and duties of everyone. It perverts the sentiment of justice. It qualifies as a crime and punishes every action which violates or threatens the privileges of the rulers and the property owners and declares as just and legal the most outrageous exploitation of the poor, the slow and sustained material and more assassination perpetrated by those who have at the expense of those who have not. If it appoints itself as the administrator of public services, again, as always, it looks after the interests of the rulers and the property owners and does not attend to those of the working people, except where it has where it has to because the people agree to pay. If it assumes the role of teacher, it hampers the propagation of truth and tends to prepare the minds and the hearts of the young to become either ruthless tyrants or docile slaves, according to the class which they belong. In the hands of government, everything becomes a means for exploitation. Everything becomes a policing institution, useful only for keeping the people in check. And it has to be thus. For if human existence is a struggle between men, there must obviously be winners and losers. And government, which is the prize in the struggle and a means for guaranteeing to the victors the results of victory and for perpetuating them, will certainly never fall into the hands of those who lose. Whether the struggle is based on physical force, is intellectual, or is in the field of economics. And those who have struggled with, that is, to secure better conditions for themselves than others enjoy and to win privileges and power will certainly not use it to defend the rights of the vanquished and set limits on their own power as well as that of their friends and, and supporters. The government, or as some call it, the judiciary state, as a moderator in the social struggle and the impartial administrator of the public interest is a lie, an illusion, <clears throat> A utopia that never achieved and never to be realized. If man's interests were really mutually antagonistic, if the struggle between men was indeed a basic essential law of human societies, and if the liberty of the individual were to be limited by the liberty of others, then everyone would always seek to ensure that his interests prevailed. Everyone would try to increase his own freedom at the expense of other people's freedoms, and one would have a government not just because it would be more or less useful to all members of society to have one, but because the victors would want to make sure the fruits of victory by thoroughly subjecting the vanquished and so free themselves from the trouble of being permanently on the defense and trusting their defense to men especially trained as professional armed guards in that case mankind would be condemned to perish or be forever struggling between the tyranny of the victors and the rebellion of the vanquished but unfortunately, the future of mankind is a happier one. But, uh, but unfortunately, the future of mankind is a happier one because the law governing it is milder. Milder. This law is solidarity. Man's fundamental essential characteristics are the instinct of his own preservation, without which no living being could exist, and the instinct of the preservation of the species, without no species could ever have developed and endured. He is naturally driven to defend his individual existence and well-being, as well as that of his offspring against everything and everybody. In nature, living beings have two ways of survival uh, and making life more pleasant. One is by individual struggle against the elements and against other individuals of the same or other species. The other is by mutual aid, by cooperation, which, is, which could also be described as association for the struggle against all natural factors antagonistic to the existence the development and the well-being of those associated 
Apart from considerations of space, there is no need to examine the pages that follow the relative role in the evolution of the organic world played by these two principles of struggle and of cooperation. It will suffice it will suffice to state that so far as man is concerned, cooperation, voluntary or compulsory, has become the only means towards progress. Uh, advancement and security and that struggle a relic of our ancestors has not only proved useless in ensuring individual well-being but also is harmful to everybody victors and vanquished alike the accumulated and communicated experience of the generations taught men that by uniting with other men their individual safety and well-being were enhanced Thus, as the res- just ah, thus as a result of the very struggle for existence waged against the natural environments and against individuals of the same species, a social feeling was developed in man which completely transformed the conditions of his existence. And on the strength of this, man was able to emerge from the animal state and rise to great power And so lift himself above the other animals that anti-materialist philosophers thought it necessary to invent an immaterial and immortal soul for him. Many concurrent causes have contributed to the development of the social feeling which, starting from the animal basis of the instinct of preservation of the species, which is the social instinct limited to the natural family, has reached great heights both in intensity and in extent. So much so that it constitutes the very basis of man's moral nature. Man, though he had not emerged from the lower order of animal life, was weak and unequipped to engage in individual struggle against the carnivorous beasts, but with a brain capable of great development, a vocal organ capable of expressing with a variety of sounds uh, different cerebral vibrations, and with hands specially suitable for fashioning matter to his will, must have very soon felt the need for and the advantages to be derived from association. Indeed, one can say that he can only emerge from the animal state when he became a social being and acquired the use of language, which is at the same time a consequence of and an important factor in sociability. The relatively small number of human beings, because it made the struggle for existence between men, even without association, less bitter, less prolonged, less necessary, must have greatly facilitated the development of feeling of sympathy and allowed time to discover and appreciate the usefulness of mutual aid. Finally, man's ability to modify his external environment and adapt it to his needs, which he acquired thanks to his original qualities applied in cooperation with a smaller or larger number of associates, the increasing number of demands which grow as the means of satisfying them grow, and because needs, or and became needs. The division of labor, which is the outcome of the systematic exploitation of nature to man's advantage, All these factors have resulted in social life becoming the necessary environment for man, outside of which he cannot go on living, or if he does, he returns to the animal state. And by the refinement of feelings with the growth of relations and by customs impressed upon uh, the species through hereditary over thousands of centuries, this need of social life, of an exchange of thoughts and feelings, has become for mankind a way of being which is essentially to our way of life and has been transformed into sympathy, friendship, love, and goes on independently of the material advantages that association provides, so much so that in order to satisfy it, one often faces all kinds of suffering and even death. In other words, the enormous advantages that accrue to men through association, the state of physical inferiority in no wise comparable uh, to his intellectual superiority in which he finds himself in relation to the animal kingdom if he remains isolated. The possibility for men to join with an ever-growing number of individuals in relationships ever more intimate and complex to the point where the association extends to all mankind in all aspects of life and perhaps more than anything to the possibility for man to produce through work and cooperation with others more than he needs for survival and the effective sentiment that springs from all these all have given to the human struggle for for 
existence quite a different complexion from the struggle that is generally waged by other members of the animal kingdom. Although we now know, and the findings of contemporary naturalists are daily providing us with new evidence, that cooperation has played and continues to play a, a most important role in the development of the organic world unsuspected by those who sought, quite irreverently anyway, to justify bourgeois rule with Darwin theories, uh, yet the goal separating the struggle of man from that of the animal kingdom remains enormous and in direct ratio to the distance between man and other animals. The other animals fight either individually or more often in small, permanent, or transitory groups against all nature, including other individuals of the same species. The mere social creatures among them, such as the ants, bees, etc., are loyal to all the individuals within the same ant hill or swarm, but are at war with or indifferent to other communities of the same species. Human struggle instead tends to always widen the association among men, their community of interests, and to develop the feelings of love of man for his fellows, of conquering and overcoming the external forces of nature by humanity uh, and for humanity. Every struggle aimed at gaining advantages independently of or at the expense of others is contrary to the social nature of modern man and tends to drive him back towards the animal state. Solidarity, that is the harmony of interests and of feelings, the coming together of individuals for the well-being of all and for the well-being of each, is the only environment in which man can express his personality and achieve his optimum development and enjoy the greatest possible well-being. This is the goal towards which human evolution advances. It is the higher principle which resolves all existing antagonisms that would otherwise be insoluble and results in the freedom of each not being limited by, but complemented, indeed, finding the, the necessary reason in the freedom of others. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.